Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Everybody say a future and a hope. Today we're going to smack the devil upside his head because we're going after defeating discouragement. The reality is every one of us face discouragement. At some point, some time in our life, some battle with it more than others, but we face discouragement. It is a part of what we face, but we don't recognize often, we talked about it last week, that when we have these things because they're very emotional, often we own them as ours. And we don't realize that it is assignment of the enemy. Because God has not given you discouragement, he's given you a future and a hope. Say that to me, God has given to me a future and hope. And hope. And hope. Discouragement will bring, discouragement will distract you. Discouragement will rob you of your strength. Discouragement will steal from you your faith. Discouragement will cause you to focus on the problem. Discouragement will cause you to want to give up. Discouragement will cause you to try and find comfort in something else. And finally, discouragement will rob God of his praise. I shared with you the story last week about how we went through this time in our, our former church back in Corona, California, and, and we had that prophecy that was a real word from God, but we misinterpreted it, we misunderstood it, and as a result, even though God did what he said he was going to do, we didn't think God did what he said he was going to do. I know none of y'all can relate. And so instead of giving him praise, we got discouraged. And then we lost our building two weeks later, we were renting. We went from five services a week to one service on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Lost 70% of our people because I found out real quick, people in Southern California don't, don't go to church at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. How I many you know people are ficky, fickle? They're ficky too. Woo! Yes, Holy Ghost. And so I, 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 I started really dealing and battling with discouragement and just being discouraged in the nations the meetings are doing incredible and at home we're just really struggling and i i was really battling with discouragement and the lord spoke to me and he told me something and i want you to put this can we get the board up here i got to put some things down though i want to put something in your spirit there are three conditions that you'll always be in you're in one of three these three positions in the body of christ in the army of god we are the army of god we're the bride of christ and army of god we're one bad bride and when you're in, in, the, in the army of God, you're in one of three positions at all times. You're either, at, you're either at camp, you're marching, or you're fighting. You're either at camp, you're marching, and you're fighting. And all three of them have power, are powerful. Camp is a great place. Camp is a place you get trained. Camp is a place you get healed up. Camp is a place you get refreshed. Now, I know a lot of Christians who just want to camp out. They don't want to march, and they definitely don't want to fight. They want to hang out at camp. Problem is, if all you're ever doing is camp, and you're just eating and resting, you're going to get fat. Huh? But camp is, is an important place. It's a place when you're wounded that you can get healed up. But the reason you're getting healed up is not so you can hang out in camp and never go back to battle. The reason you get healed up is so you can go back to battle. We are in a war. Y'all, we're in a war. Come on, we're in a war for America right now. No, y'all didn't hear what I just said. We're in a, more, a war for America right now. Y'all understand what's going on right now? We got the first attempt at American dictatorship. I'm not going to get political. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. The Constitution just got trampled underfoot. It's been being trampled. But this is an attempt. There's a, God has shown me the demon spirits of behind the scenes. But I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, the plans of the enemy, if we will pray, will come tumbling down. Huh? Professor in a university just stood up and told the students, if you, are, if you are against gay marriage, you need to drop my class. 
This is America, folks. Where did the right of dissent go? Where did its first, first uh, for free amendment and, and, and free speech go? When, when in the schools they're saying you're not even allowed to speak up against it. They're about to pass laws like it is in England and it is in Canada right now. If you say anything negative about homosexuality, it is a crime. Are y'all hearing me? Someone said the devil's a liar. And now they're standing up doing all this other stuff. Now, I believe we need to have some kind of, our, our, our immigration and border situation is a mess. And we need to get that thing fixed. Amen? Come on, I got friends that have been trying to get into America, highly skilled people for 10 years, can't even get a, a work permit, can't even come. They own a home just around the corner here. They can't even come live in their home. We got to get some things fixed. But we've got to sit there and understand that the devil wants to pervert and use emotional issues to trace, to set things up. Y'all ever see Star Wars? Senator Palpatine? Come on. You, you say, when I, when I watch that, when I watch the first, not, not the 1996 version or 80, 76, whatever. I'm talking about the, 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 the latest ones. I sit there and I said, man, George Lucas is brilliant. That's exactly what the devil's going to do in the end times. He's going to use crises. He's going to use emotional issues to try to gain power. I'm not trying to get highly political. I'm just telling you this because we need to pray. There's a reason the Constitution made the presidency weak. It made it weak because the ability of a president to become a king or an emperor or a dictator is very real. And they knew it because they were under King George. And they said, we want to set up a system that can never happen again. And it's true. Sometimes well-meaning, well-intentioned ideas, but the power gets crossed. The purpose of the enemy is to bring an assignment against us. Don't you fool yourself. Everything that's going on is about God and the devil. Everything going on is about the church and about the ungodly. Huh? And that's why we need to pray for our leaders. Because sometimes they're well-meaning. They mean good, but they do wrong things. And they're being used by the enemy to set things up. Are y'all are hearing me? Y'all don't want to know what I've seen in the spirit. I've seen some stuff, but I'm telling you, God also spoke to me. He said, I'm about to do a great act of mercy in America. I say, why, why, why do you speak about this stuff on Sunday mornings? Pastor Steve, it makes people uncomfortable because I'm a prophet. It's like fire shut up in my bones. I can't help it. Huh? Everything we've been prophesying for years has come to pass. You go on the internet, type in Steve Foss, prophetic warning, everything. This pastor, this was an, uh, an African-American church, Baptist church, full gospel that I was just in. He turned to me. He said, I read your prophecy about what was going to happen in the last six years. He said, everything you spoke came to pass. And I said, yeah, but God, I said, and there's some more things that are coming to pass. But God show me that he's about to do an incredible act of mercy in America. Woo, hallelujah. If we pray. If we pray. If we pray, if we call upon the name of the Lord, his plans towards us are good. He has a future and a hope. See, what, why, you say, why are you addressing this? Because there's a lot of Christians, the enemy has been attacking us with discouragement. Oh, man, we're losing the battle. Oh, man, gay marriage is now in 36 states. It was two years ago, it was just in one. Oh, man, now legalized pot is going all crazy. Oh, man, look what's happening. Pastors are being subpoenaed for, their, for, the, for what they're preaching and their personal messages. Oh, man, look what's happening in the federal government. Look at the executive actions. Oh, man, look at how messed up Congress is. Look, look at how messed up our families are. Look at how messed up everything is. Look at ISIS. Look at Ebola. Oh, what's going on? God says, hey, if my people which are called by my name, will stop whining and complaining and humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The problem is we need to get a lot more people on the front lines to fight. But God spoke to me, and he said, as long as you're discouraged, I have to send you back to camp. Because discouraged people are distracted. Discouraged people are a danger to themselves, and they're a danger to everybody around them. Come on, amen. Because you don't want a distracted person on the front lines. You don't want a distracted person driving you. 
Come on, y'all, y'all ever been in the car with a distracted driver? I was driving through my neighborhood. Oh, I shouldn't confess this, but I will. I was, dri- I was driving through my neighborhood just the other day on a Saturday. Saturday morning, no one around. And I looked down to a text. And the road just by, right by the school just slightly curves, just ever so slightly. I, I, I looked out for a moment at a text. Next thing I know, I'm up on the curb heading right towards a pole. Go, bam, hit the curb, yanked out, missed the pole by about this much. In fact, I didn't even tell my wife, hi, sweetie. I was a distracted driver. Discouragement will cause you to become distracted. And distracted people, see the enemy wants to get you discouraged because you can't pray with faith when you are discouraged. Come on, y'all hearing me? Satan is already, but we, we have to understand that Satan is already defeated. I don't know if you remember the story when David was in, in Ziglag. And he was going out, and they were fighting battles on the front lines. And while they were fighting battles, the enemy went in and attacked his camp and took the women and took the children. <laughs> I'm going to give you a spiritual warfare strategy. When you go, when you're fighting, you always got to make sure and be aware that the enemy is going to try to attack you in four areas. He's going to try to attack you in your family. In your friends, in your finances, finances, and your, we'll pretend it's an F, physical body. God spoke to me. He said, when you're praying the prayer of agreement, he said, you got to pray strategically when you're going to spiritual warfare prayer. Don't have everybody on the front lines fighting. Have a few people guarding the rear guard. Come on, you have somebody already always praying, protecting. Like when we head on to Africa, many of you guys are they're, they're praying for the trips over there. But what the prayer teams are doing on the prayer calls is they're also praying for my, my family. They're praying for my friends. They're praying for my finances and my physical body. Why? Because the enemy, when you're on the front lines, will try to come behind and attack you. You know why? Because once he attacks you back there, then you're going to retreat from the front lines to go shore up the, 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 the home front. And if you keep having to do that, you end up getting tired and you don't walk out, run out to bat. You know, first, first off, you're all excited. Spiritual warfare. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get it all fixed up. Okay. All right. Finances are all right. Fine. Body's okay. Family's okay. All right. Whoa. All right. Figure. And before long, I'm just going to hang out at home. I got to keep protecting my family, my finances, my physical body. Come on, amen. Because we we need to cover those things in prayer. And understand, that's a strategy of the enemy. And so here's what what happens. You go on, you take on, you say, hey. Hey. We're going to take on this region and break this religious spirit in Dallas-Fort Worth. We're tearing down the, the, the cultural demons of Goliath. We're going to go reach 20,000 souls. Oh, oh, whoa, the devil's ticked off. Man, finances, f- battles, and fi- physical battles, and, and, and family going all crazy. Come on, Amen. Anybody here know, know what I'm talking about? And you're like, but Lord, I thought, I thought if I was out here doing here, you would just take care of there. He said, I gave you weapons to take care of there. But understand, there's an underlying strategy. It's not just the battle. Because a lot of us sit back and say, oh, when will the battle stop? <laughs> That's it. When the trumpet blows, that's a terrible trumpet, by the way. When the trumpet blasts, when that's it, <laughs> come on. When there's the final trumpet blast, when that's all over, that's when it's, that's when the battle, tell then you are fighting. Huh? Now, you either can be a victorious win, warrior for Christ, or you can be on the other side and be a prisoner of the enemy, but you're still going to be fighting. 
get discouraged. David went out and went to battle, came back. Women are gone. Children are gone. Everything's stolen. And his mighty men, his loyal mighty men, were so discouraged. In a moment, they said, David, we're going to kill you. You led us here. We thought you were a shepherd. Green shepherds. Or green shepherds, right. Green pastures. Still waters. Little gentle sheep. Ah, come on. You led us into battle. Now our women are gone. Now our children are gone. And they were so discouraged. And David was dealing with discouragement. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Because I mean, know sometimes you kids have to do it all by yourself. You ain't going to have nobody around you encourage you. Some of the worst people to call up are church folk. Well, I went to the doctor today and they gave me a bad report. Oh, my aunt had that. She died in three weeks. You better. You know, and when you stand for faith, your family will go after you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They'll tell you all the reasons why you're killing yourself. Why didn't you do it? Oh, you can't believe God. No, you can't do that. I, you know, we, we prayed and this one died and we did this and with, with, with whatever. Wait a minute. Why is that a problem? Why is it a problem that a Christian died? Come on. The, 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 the main goal of Christianity is not to avoid death. Death is graduation. Now, if you want... If you want to mourn death and you want it to be this horrible thing, do not ask me to do your funeral. Because if you're a believer, we're going to be jumping and shouting and celebrating. Hallelujah. I promise you, anybody that, that knows the Lord dies and goes to heaven and stands before the throne of God and seeing the glory of Jesus, they're not going, I'm so depressed, Lord. I really want to go back to that fallen, disgusting, vile, violent, messed up world. Smith Wigglesworth's di wife died. He grabbed her, threw her up against the wall. Get up! Rose her from the dead. She said, oh, Smith, I knew you were going to do that. Now let me, it's my time to go. Man, I love y'all, but they're going to, if I, if I go... If I drop dead right here this morning, don't you dare. Especially you Zadok School of Ministry students. Don't you dare come raise me from the dead. L let me go. Somebody say David encouraged himself in the Lord. So I want to give you a weapon right now. We're going to begin this one. I'm going to pick it up in... Uh, in my next sermon. Whew! Because we ain't going to get through all of this. I gave you the weapon briefly of praise last week. I want to give you what I believe is the Grand Slam home run weapon to discreet, defeating discouragement. Are you ready? You say, what is that weapon? Hope. Hope will destroy the power of discouragement. They cannot coexist. Hope is not just a natural thing. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 says this, Now and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, we understand that love, agape love, is not natural, but it comes only from God. Somebody say it's supernatural love. We understand that faith is not a natural life force. The Bible says you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not only is grace the gift of God, but faith is the gift of God. It has been given unto every man in context, every believer, a measure of faith. So you don't have faith in yourself. Faith is not something you can work up in yourself. It's a supernatural gift from God. Even, even if there's a supernatural level of it, or in a higher level of it, an extreme level of it, even called the gift of faith. 
So faith is a supernatural gift from God. Love is a supernatural gift from God. And so is hope. And without hope, hope is the connecting point to all of your faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> Let me say that again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Everybody say not seen. Put that deep in your spirit. We're going to explode that in about 20 minutes. When you have discouragement, you have a lack of hope. When you have discouragement, you have a lack of hope. Hope is defined as this, this word hope. It is a desire with an absolute expectation for fulfillment. It is not a wish. I wish I had a million dollars. That's a wish. A hope is a desire with an absolute expectation for fulfillment. I hope the sun will rise tomorrow. I have a desire with an absolute expectation for fulfillment. I have a reason to hope. Hope will destroy the power of discouragement. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, see there's the, that word desire connected in hope. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, dealing with the armor of God. And I want to put this, I'm laying these scriptures fast because we're going somewhere. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation. Everybody say the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take on the helmet of salvation. Now the purpose of the helmet is to protect your mind. To protect your head. Now what is this helmet of salvation? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 gives us an insight. It says, but let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. There's that faith and love again. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Everybody say the hope of salvation. So now it ties together. The helmet that protects your head is the hope of salvation. But this salvation word here is not speaking of just being born again. This salvation word here is speaking specifically of that final salvation from everything that is limited Everything that is purely just natural, everything that has fallen, it is that final salvation when we shed off this mortal body and take on a new body. It's that final salvation when the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. It's that final salvation when Jesus comes back and does everything to eradicate or comes back and eradicates everything that hinders love. They say the hope of salvation. People are wondering why we're spending so much time talking about the end times in the book of Revelation. Because your hope of the future salvation is a helmet to your present circumstance. Huh? How many know you can deal with battles now when you have a hope of a victory later? When you have a hope when you have a hope, when you lose hope, that's when you lose your strength. When you lose hope, that's when you lose the battle. You've already lost the battle. You don't have to lose the battle. I mean, you can already lost the battle when you haven't even started the battle because you lose hope. When you have hope, you can face anything. Somebody say, I can face anything. So this hope of salvation, what is this thing? Well, I'm going to go get to be with Jesus forever. Well, that's amazing. That's incredible. That's awesome. That's great. That's not all of it, but that's awesome. 
It's a hope of salvation, the hope of something that's going to take place and something that is taking place progressively. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There is a process of salvation. We got born again the day we got saved, the day we gave our life to Jesus Christ. We got born again. But a process began to take place. And there's something that is happening to us that we are being changed from glory to glory. We are being changed into His image. Now, I want to put this in your spirit. Because remember, discouragement wants to get you to focus on the problem. Hope battles that by getting you to focus on the future. God said, remember what we we started off with? He said, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. I want you to say this. I'm having you declare a lot of things. God's plans for me are all good. And say this. And God is big enough to fulfill his plans. So I know we titled this message, Don't Quit, You Will Win. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, I know the thoughts I have towards you, to give you a future and a hope. Once you begin to focus on the future and focus on the hope, then you will call upon me. Look at that. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Why? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when you're focused on the future and you're focused on the hope, then you will pray in faith, not fear. You will pray with faith. Oh, yeah, come on, this is good. See, a lot of people pray a lot of prayers, and they don't get any answers because they're not praying in faith. God didn't just say pray. you got to pray in faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. But you have no faith if you don't have any hope. And the hope isn't, I'm hoping for a new car. I'm hoping for this. I'm hoping for that. The hope is the eternal, the future. Come on, the hope is that it, the hope is this. Are you ready? Christ in you, the hope of, the hope of glory. The hope of, see God, I asked God, I said, God, how is it? That so many people, we're going to read a scripture here in a moment. But how is it that so many people go through battles? And you say that these battles are supposed to produce this great thing inside of us. And it doesn't produce this great thing inside of us. He said, because they're not truly putting their faith and their trust and their hope in me. The same battle that can cause one to be changed into his glory is the same battle that can defeat another. Depending on your focus. The devil wants you defeated, and he'll do it if he gets you discouraged. Because you'll make all kinds of bad decisions when you're discouraged. Are y'all with me on that? Watch this. Watch this. Romans Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, having been, I'm going to move fast here in a moment. I'm, I'm taking my, well. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access. I'm going to say access. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In the hope of the glory of God. Christ in you, the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of getting out of hell. The mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of not being judged for your sins. No, the mystery of the gospel in you. Christ in you, the hope of, someone say glory. Say it again, say glory. Come on, it's a whole lot of difference being hopeful for $100 and being hopeful Bill Gates gives you all of his wealth. Come on, we, 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 the, one of our problems is and the reason we lose hope so, so easily is our hope has been focused on the wrong stuff. Our hope has been focused on things. Instead of on glory. 
We've set the standard so low. We've been shooting at such a low watermark. Well, if I can just have my bills paid, and if I can just have my body healed, and if I can just have this little thing and that little thing, a little bit of peace, I'll be fine. You have set the standard so low. And the key to getting all of your needs met is not focusing on that. Come on. He said, my father knows you know these things, need these things before you even pray. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his. What is the kingdom of God? It's the kingdom of glory. You have been called by God and predestined by God to be conformed into his image. The glory. The glory. The glory that Isaiah saw when he said, I see the Lord. Seated on the throne, high and lifted up. And he fell to the ground. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. The glory that John saw when he went up and was taken up into heaven in the book of Revelation. The glory that created the universe in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we beheld the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father. The glory that fills the whole universe. The glory of God, the brightness. The brightness can, cannot even be gazed upon. And God says, you are predestined to have that in you. Someone say the hope of glory. See, we've set the standard so low, it's so pathetic. And the, re and the reason is because we put our hope not in the glory, in the future salvation, in shedding off this limited body, in shedding off this mortal body, in shedding off every weakness and becoming filled with God himself. Because we set the standard so low. Y'all with me on this? This is a little meaty for Sunday morning. Come on, come on. Y'all, y'all with me? Come on. Because we set the standard, our hope is not focused on the glory. Our hope has been focused on things and circumstances. Ooh, that's terrible. Ah, whatever. And circumstances. So we keep hoping in things and hoping in circumstances instead of hoping in glory. He didn't say hope in things. In fact, God said, hey, listen, it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. Y'all going to have some trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, there's a but, but the Lord delivers them out of them. But what does that even mean? Was the Apostle Paul delivered? I believe he was delivered, but he was crucified. He was killed. Not crucified, but he was, he was killed. Was Peter delivered? Yeah, he was crucified upside down. Wait a minute. Have you read, have you read the faith chapter? They all died. They were torn asunder, sawed in two, fed to lions. And God said, they are the heroes of faith. He said they didn't even receive the promise, but they had a hope. They had a hope. They weren't focused on the now. They were focused on the future. I'm talking about the future, not two weeks from now. You know, when you die, hopefully you live. 1950. 2030, you know your whole life is summed up? Right there. That's it. A little dash. The Bible says it's but a whisper. Here, gone. In the scope of eternity, it is absolutely nothing. It's gone. And we put all of our hope in the little incidences that are happening here. And God says, that's not where I want your focus. That's why the devil keeps beating you up. Because you keep focusing on the things and the circumstances. But if I can get your mind to focus on the glory... If I can get your mind to focus on the glory, you will never be discouraged. In which we have, in which we start, verse 2, Romans 5, 2. Through whom we have access by faith into this grace, which is the favor of God that gives us access to the power of God for everything we need for life and godliness. We stand. Everybody say, we stand. Say it again, say, I stand. 
and rejoice in the hope of glory. Now watch what he says. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. We get excited when it gets tough. Now, over here in America, we don't understand that. But I'm telling you, our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted, Christianity is the number one persecuted religion in the world, hands down. Hands down, over 330,000 Christians will be murdered for their faith in the globe today. You don't hear about that. Let one Muslim die and the whole world goes crazy. Let 100,000 Christians be killed. Oh, well. You think I'm kidding. It's happening and it's happening now. All over the world, just because it's not happening in our backyard yet. I pray it doesn't. Come on, amen. I pray it doesn't. But he says, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces something. It produces perseverance. Or better translated, endurance. It produces endurance. So that's when I asked God. I said, well, it doesn't produce endurance in everybody. Cause a lot of people to quit. Come on, amen. He said that's because they haven't put their hope in the glory. Look two verses on. They haven't put their hope in the glory. They put their hope in things and circumstances so they get destroyed by the circumstances and by the tribulations. But if they'll put their hope in the glory and understand that even as the battle comes, I'm doing a work of glory inside of them. If they understand that there is nothing that has come your way, that I have not allowed, that is not going to bring about a transformation inside of you. There's nothing that I'm not going to use for all things work together for good. Even the bad circumstances, I am God and I have a way of turning it around. Woo. And perseverance character and i love that word character there because it actually means more than just character it actually speaks of a proof that something is true so he says this tribulation works when our hope is in the glory the tribulation actually produces an endurance with us that becomes a public proof that this glory is real. When they begin to see you go through the fire and yet you got peace and let you got victory and let you encourage and you're not discouraged and you got hope in the glory of God, that endurance that you manifest begins to be a public testimony that the word of Christ is true. And character, this proof that it's true, produces more hope. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. How many ever been through a financial battle? Come on. And it was just, I know I mean, you just didn't know where it was going to come from. And then God came through. You walked out of here with some hope. Come on, amen. My God shall supply all my needs. <laughs> And I've, I've, I've had, I, like the Apostle Paul, I've abounded and I've abased. I've had plenty and I've had not so much. I've had not where I couldn't put two nickels together. I've had it where I just didn't know how you're going to pay the bill and put food on the table. But I tell you, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed out begging for bread. And through it all, God was doing something inside of me. I like this. Now hope does not disappoint. Hope. Someone say hope of glory. Say it again. Say hope of glory. Now, I know where our minds are going. Brother Steve, okay, that's great and fine and dandy, but I, that's hard when we're living in this natural world to focus on the glory that's going to come after the rapture or after we die. It's kind of hard to be focused on that. It's a little mystical and ethereal. And I understand that, and that's a big dimension of that. But that's not the fullness of what you're to focus on. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that as we continue to behold in the word of God and as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transfigured into his image from one degree of glory to another. 
Somebody say the transformation has begun now. Say it now. See, the enemy has been very successful at robbing the church of the product of your troubles. The product of your troubles was always supposed to be more glory. You understand? The biggest wounds you'll ever go through if you'll get it and put it before God correctly and you get your hope set correctly, that's the area the greatest anointing will flow out of. Don't you understand that God will turn around every circumstance and negative circumstance in your life and use it as a powerful tool to minister to somebody else and to tear down a stronghold in somebody else? Hallelujah. Have you read the, the testimonies? Have you read? I, I encourage you, you ought to go read the biographies of many of these great saints. Man, the ones that we, we look at, we say, wow, what an amazing life. These guys lived in the fire. How did they have so much glory now? Because they had so much fire now. So it's time we begin to stand up with holy attitude and say, you know what, devil, you're a liar. You've been throwing all this junk at me and I've been, I've been caught up I've been discouraged and disappointed because I was thinking it was all about down here. Waiting because I, I was listening to too many preachers telling me that this was where God, he's going to make everything all right and going to make everything happy. He, wants you, he just wants you happy. He wants you happy. No, he doesn't. He wants you full of glory. Come on, he wants you full of glory. I said he wants you full of glory. And sometimes you got to go through some stuff. There's no way to get the junk out of you except the fire. Human nature is when we're comfortable, we don't change. Comfort is the curse of a compromised gospel. True change only comes by confrontation. That's why, that's why I, I I'm so, have such challenges with a lot of the preaching that we see in the Western world because it's so comfortable and so compromised. That people go in and go out, and there's no real, well, we don't want to make them uncomfortable. I do. Why? Not because they're not, not so they leave. No, so they get some glory. Come on, amen. You don't even learn how to really walk in forgiveness until you get betrayed really bad. Come on, amen. Come on, you ain't, you ain't walking in forgiveness when someone at the store had an attitude with you. But when your best friend betrayed you, when someone you trusted with everything utterly laid you out, threw you under the bus, and lied about you, and assaulted your character, and then you got to rise up and walk in forgiveness now. You're learning about the glory of forgiveness. Hallelujah. David was only the great king because he went through great battles. Watch what Paul said, because he had this revelation. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction. I love his attitude. Do you know who's saying this? This is the man that was beat with rods multiple times. Flogged. Jesus got whipped with the cat of nine tails. That's a whip that has shards of glass and rock and blade metal in it and they would whip you and then yank it and it would yank huge chunks of skin and muscle right off jesus got 39 stripes one time paul got it three times most people don't even live shipwreck naked often beat often left for dead are y'all hearing me rejected everywhere he went Battles everywhere he went, in prison so many times, and jail back then isn't Club Med like today. Jail back then was a little tiny little cell you couldn't stand in. You had to go to the bathroom in it. You had to eat off the floor in it. The rats were chewing at you all night long. And Paul, in this circumstance, like none of us in this building have ever gone through, said these light afflictions. 
Do you understand the power of hope that is in his life? That he can look at the worst of the circumstances that mankind can throw upon humanity and he can call them light. And yet we got so, I'm going, I'm going, come on. We got some of us, we're ready to quit because you're tired, you blew up. We're ready to quit because you just had another car breakdown. We're ready to quit because some, your boss cussed you out at work. We're ready to give up on God. Why? Because we keep hoping on, on things here and on circumstances. We don't have the hope of glory. But look what Paul said. For our, this is, here's the key. Everybody say, here's the key. Say it again. Say, here's the key. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I got the revelation that every time the enemy attacks me, every time I go through a battle, God is using that circumstance to release more glory. Look what he said in the Amplified. Look what he said in the Amplified. Come on, give me five, five more minutes. Come on, I'm just, I'm just warming up. Come on. For our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations of vast, and transcending glory and blessedness never to cease. Someone say hope of glory. So he's saying that my circumstances are designed to release and produce and work in me an eternal glory that is so beyond comparison and all calculations. It's transcendent and it'll never cease. Verse 18. And from the Amplified. Since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Now, other translations say, while, while we consider, very important word there. That word, since or while, means this. To watch out for, implying a response to danger, to be concerned or keep thinking about, pondering, or fix our attention on. So what he's saying is, I'm going to paraphrase it. Our affliction produces in us glory because, let me say because, because we do not keep thinking about, pondering, fixing our attention, and are not concerned about the danger of the things that are seen. But we are focused. Keep thinking about, ponder, and fix our attention on the glory of God being manifest in and through our bodies. Let me read the verse, and then I'm going to read that again. Since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporal, brief, and fleeting. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. So let me read what I wrote again. This is my own paraphrase based on the original meanings of these words. Our affliction produces in us glory. Our affliction produces in us glory. I don't have time to get to it today, but Earlier in first, Second Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> he says, For it is God, I, no, let me read it, verse 6 through 9, verse 10. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory. Let me say glory. 
the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. Somebody say, we have the glory. In earthen vessels. See, this is not a glory that's in some far distant future way out there. This is the glory that's inside of you right now. It's already in you. Now watch. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Why? Because we have a hope and glory. We are perplexed. It means we don't know what to do. Anybody ever been there? But not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. From the Amplified, verse 10 says it this way. Always carrying about in the body the liability and exposure to the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered. So that. Can we put that up? The Amplified? Is it not? So that, 2 Corinthians 4.10 from the Amplified. So that the resurrection life of Jesus may also be shown forth by and in our body. Constantly handed over to death so that life can come out. There is a glory of God. Jesus said, my father and I will come and make our abode in you. The glory that fills the universe is inside of you as a believer. And God says, there's a mystery. There's a hope of glory. The circumstances, the tribulations, the trials, the battles you're going through are designed to release the glory. They're designed. When you have a hope, that's why Paul could look at the most horrific circumstances and say these are light and momentary afflictions. See, as long as your hope is on the things and circumstances, you will easily become emotionally overwhelmed. Some people easier than others, but humans reach a limit. But when your hope is the glory of God, the future and a hope, and you begin to realize that no weapon formed against me truly in the end shall possibly prosper. And that every time I'm afflicted, glory is being manifested. And as I just stay focused on him, he's causing the junk to fade away. And the, the, the fire just makes me more and more refined to be like him. And the more I'm weak, the stronger Jesus becomes. Oh, when you start getting this hope, there's nothing that can defeat you. Someone say, nothing can defeat me. <sighs> Second Corinthians 4, 16. I, I got to stop. I'm only halfway through. Are you getting something this morning? Second Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. That word literally means we do not become discouraged. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, the one created in the image of God, the seed of Christ, the incorruptible seed that's on the inside, the glory that's on the inside, the inward man is being renewed day by day. We do not lose heart. As a matter what's happening in my circumstances. We're only overwhelmed in our minds because we're focused on the wrong thing. But when we're focused on the glory, we'll be like James and said, consider it pure joy. You suffer diverse temptations and trials. 
because we realize we have our hope and our faith locked in the fact that we are born again, predestined by God to be conformed to His image, that His angels will begin charge over us, and that God is working in us a far more exceedingly eternal weight of glory, and that no matter what circumstance comes our way, more of Jesus is going to come out, more of the glory of God is going to be manifested. I'm being moved into my destiny. Hallelujah! You'll never be discouraged. You'll never be discouraged. I said you'll never be discouraged. You'll never be discouraged. You'll never be discouraged. You'll say, come on, devil, throw your best shot. Because every time you hit me, more glory is coming out. 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 Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Shake her off. Shake off the discouragement. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. He's working a way to glory in me. He's working a way to glory.